uh, is there a link to this thing that we want to like send out? Yeah, it's on my Facebook page. You can go there and find it, um, and then share that one. Don't share the link to the Google Hangout though, because then people will hop into that and that'll be awkward. <laughs> <laughs> I almost right. I that one, so I tagged everyone in a link on Facebook, so that's good. Yeah, I did a good okay. thing. Let's see if it's going on my end. It says live on mine. It does. Perfect. Okay. So, hello everyone and welcome to another discussion about Savannah College of Art and Design. Tonight I'm joined by Taylor Carlisle, Kennedy Cook Garza, Christina Ness, and Lee Weil, and we'll be talking about what it's like to major in sequential art at SCAD, which is the best major, just saying. <laughs> Uh, it is the best. The animation was pretty cool to talk about, but this would be the really good one. And anyway, because I have so many sequential people to talk to, this discussion will probably be divided into two or maybe three parts based on who else can make it um, in the following weeks. So, as usual, I'll be asking um, some questions and then we'll move over into a Q&A session afterwards. So, um, during the this thing. If you guys in the chat have any questions, you can um, type them over there and I'll get to them later, but otherwise I think I'll have my guests introduce ourselves. So, um, let's see. Who do we have here? <laughs> uh, uh, if you guys want to go ahead and introduce yourselves, tell us who you are, uh, when you attended SCAD, and maybe what you're currently working on. So, we'll go alphabetical. So, I think that was Taylor, your first. Oh, snap. Okay. Uh, my name's Taylor Carlisle. I graduated in May of 2014, almost two years ago exactly. Um, and I'm currently working on... I have a Kickstarter going right now for a comic book project that I've been working on for a while. I'm, it's kind of pointless to talk about it now because it's going to end in 70 hours, but um, I guess if you wanted, we could post that in, I could post that in the chat if people are interested. Yes, do it. Let's Don't give do up, it. man, because the Mystery Science Theater <laughs> one got, like, the other million in the last couple hours, so there's hope. So, <laughs> there we go. All right, there. Oh. Oh, I can't. It says remove any web addresses and try again. Oh, well, okay. Oh, whoops. I'll get it to everybody. <laughs> Thanks, but, YouTube. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, YouTube. Thanks, <laughs> YouTube. Um, and then, Kennedy, you go next. Oh, except you're muted. Oops. Let me... There you go. Good. No. Yeah. Yes. Hello. Hi, I'm Kennedy. Um, I also graduated last May in 2014. Um, I ran... I formerly did the webcomic Super Bitch for a couple of years, which is on hiatus right now. Um, so straight after I graduated, I went into video games for a while. I was working as a 2D artist at a mobile studio here in Florida, and I left that in September, I think, so... I've actually been full-time freelancing since then, which is pretty great. Mm-hmm. And then Leavely died. Um, so oh, no. You were next anyway. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm Christina Ness. I also graduated in 2014 with these fine folks, and I currently am a... I have veered away from the comics route just a bit, and I'm doing concept art for games at Runic Games right now. Yay. Yay. <laughs> You're our best cheerleader. And gosh, Lily did warn us that her internet might be going out. So um, she also graduated with us in 2014. We were a great class. A lot of us were in intro together, I think. No, we weren't. We and Lily were, whatever. <laughs> Some of the other people are from my intro class later on. But she does an awesome webcomic called Goth Western, which I will bring up in a minute. But. We can move on to the biggest question of all. So if you guys could mention what sequential art is, because I think a lot of people don't actually know. Yeah, I'll take, take a shot. <laughs> uh, sequential art is the combination of text and images to create a combined deeper meaning. That was so scientific. <laughs> you should have like a lab coat that's, and a white board. I, yeah, I like it. Yeah. I always, I always explain it as just, it's just like a really fancy way to c talk about comics and stuff. I mean, it's it's evolved since then, but that's why it was created, right? It was like, like uh, was it Will Eisner? He was like, no one's going to take it serious if it's called comics. Let's just call it <laughs> sequential art. But it's it's evolved beyond that because now you have concept art and storyboarding. But, yeah, mm -hmm. it's basically what Ness said. <laughs> I'm going to leapfrog on that. 
So. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go ahead and agree with that. My uh, running gag that I kept telling people when I was actually going to school at SCAD is that uh, I'm going to school for sequential art, which is an extremely pretentious word for comics. Um, but obviously, you know, that it, had, it has evolved to apply to a lot of things, kind of like storyboarding and um, concept art, like they said. Sorry, um, my screen keeps slipping. I have the Cintiq. <laughs> oh, I wondered. <laughs> Other than that, yeah, the front-facing camera is, like, uh, if it's just on its stand regularly, it's, like, staring straight up into the ceiling, so... I oh, my God, leave it, leave back. I made it. Back. I my phone. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. We were just I'll doing, um, not working. We were doing introductions, and I told them about your goth western comic, which is super cool, so... Oh, if there's anything you. anybody else should know about you... Let them know. Uh, gosh, what are the what are the things we're supposed to say for internet? Oh, just um, I mentioned that we graduated at the same time. So, um, what are you currently working on? Um, well, aside from goth western, not a whole lot. It kind of takes up all my free time. I work at a pawn shop and sometimes do comics about that. Um, and a little bit of freelance illustration here and there. You have fun pawn shop stories. I follow you on Twitter, and your Twitter. Your tweets about <laughs> your pawn shop stories. I have too many, <laughs> too many pawn shop stories. Yeah, every, everybody follow Levely on Twitter because it's like a bunch of like out of context quotes that I'm very confused <laughs> about. But <laughs> <laughs> all right, yeah. good. I hope your internet hangs in there, but we'll survive yeah, the tech should, issues. Should be better on this one. Okay. Um, so when you guys applied to SCAD, did you know right off the bat that you wanted to major in sequential art, or did you find out more about it later and change your mind? Let's go for I it. knew right away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to do comics since, like, third grade. Like, I was drawing and writing not, not good stuff. But uh, I went to SCAD for comics, and then found out there was a concept art minor, and the, the two go hand in hand, in my opinion, for me, so. Yeah, I'm pretty much the same way. Like, I went to SCAD. SCAD was my only real one that I wanted to go to. Like, I had looked at, like, a couple others, but since they didn't have anything even really related to comics, it was a lot more fine art stuff. And then I was like, SCAD has sequential arts. Like, all right, so that's basically the, my only option, and I'm glad, you know... <laughs> So, yeah. So it's it was kind of like it was it was really the only one that I looked at, and so there wasn't a lot of process in deciding on going. So. I actually applied to SCAD to go to animation, um, and then when I went to the SCAD day, which is like the um, the sort of orientation or I guess pre orientation day, where you go around and look at all the stuff, I went to the animation building, and it was so huge and cold and there were no windows and then I went to um, I guess the former sequential art building Norris Hall and there were like two professors there and we were the only people in the tour group at that moment and or, me and like my mom who was with me and they were like we'll show you the whole building this is sequential art and then I switched to sequential art and I've never looked back. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually the same the same experience I had when you see the animation building for the first time and you see sad, broken people. It's just like, oh, maybe not. <laughs> you can like literally see their souls leave their body as they. Right. Were. We love the animation building at SCAD, Monty Hall. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> um, no, it was the same thing with me. Uh, sequential art was uh, the major that drew me to SCAD at first, um, but ironically, I ended up going my freshman year into illustration for whatever reason, and then switched to sequential of my sophomore year. So, but yeah, it was, it was definitely what like drew me to the school. I think. Yeah, because I wanted to do animation too, but I, I think a lot of us dabbled maybe in other things first um, and then switched over later. I think, though, there were a lot of people in intro that stuck with it through the whole thing. So, <laughs> comics <laughs> is fun, guys, we promise. <laughs> um, so, the foundations courses that we start with in the curriculum, um, did you guys think that they were really helpful or did you think they were kind of boring because you've had a lot of experience drawing before that? Well, I know, like, we all have, like, different opinions based on 
who we had for like intro to, se- to sequential. Yeah. Like, did you did you like having Jan- Jancy? I did. It was a great class. It was really challenging though. Yeah, because I've heard people say that like they didn't like Ralph, his, his intro, but. I liked that Jancy had us use like the actual the tools because some of the people I knew in different classes were working with like sharpies and. Dancy was mm-hmm. like, here, use like a nib pen and do all this stuff. Although he didn't tell us how to clean our brushes properly, which is a thing you should know before you use a brush. Yeah. <laughs> Lisa, are you talking about uh, like foundations classes for sequential or foundations classes? Oh, like- I was talking about before you take any sequential classes, oh, okay. Okay. not even intro. Like yeah, it. yeah. I'd throw say, my, uh, my response out the window. That no, that's the next question. So. Oh. <laughs> Should go through them. Uh, I got into SCAD with like a lot of IB credit, so I got to skip, I think, like design one and drawing one. Um, but other than that, color theory, eh. It really depends on like what professors you have, but I'd say don't lament them. I don't know if we can curse <laughs> on this stream or you want us to curse, um, but do not complain because then you're not learning. Just buckle up, buckle down, do some good stuff, and uh, mm-hmm. look forward to the intro classes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You learn some good skills, I think, but like... For me, it was hard because it's a totally different way of drawing than I was used to. Because, like, like in drawing one, you're supposed to, you know, stand an arm's length from the easel with your charcoal, and I'm used to drawing like all hunched over with my hand. So, mm-hmm. I mean, it's definitely, I don't know, mind widening. I guess I I didn't super like foundations, but I mean, I don't regret taking. Yeah, I'd probably say the same thing um, to actually answer the question you asked instead of what you're <laughs> skipping ahead. Um, yeah, like, it, it gives you a new perspective. It, it challenges you because you're not used to doing stuff the way, you know, you're used to. So I guess from that perspective, they're helpful. Because I remember in drawing two, like, where we really buckled down on um, charcoals and pastels and stuff like that, and I liked... I like life drawing. Like life drawing is probably my favorite of the foundations. If that still counts, that's like drawing three, isn't it? Yeah, that still counts. Kind yeah. yeah. So that was that's probably my favorite one because it's like you know just drawing people and stuff. And then then you take um, that one class with Dove. I, it was an elective I took, which was about it was human anatomy and stuff. So it was like you know a continuation of that and applying it to sequential art. So it was like a nice proper course for it. So. Yeah. Um, <laughs> my situation was about the same thing. Um, I mean, I enjoyed the foundations. I feel like uh, some of the really early ones can be a little rudimentary for you, like drawing one or, you know, design one. Like, a lot of people skipped out of those, which I didn't find out, you know, until I was well into like, most of my foundations. But it's like, <laughs> for kids that, you know, drew through most of their high school, it's like, and I know it depends on what professor you have, but, like, I felt like a lot of them were kind of, eh. I mean, it's good to brush up on those skills, but it can be kind of, you know, it's definitely see if you can test out of it and save you some money, like five hundred dollars or so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's that that like second portfolio or whatever the like the specifically testing out portfolio. I didn't yeah, submit yeah. one, so like I didn't realize that you could do that. I yeah, guess. I didn't think you could do that either. So. Oh, I heard about that last minute, and I'm glad I did because I jumped ahead. Um, <laughs> actually, if you do that though, this is a warning to anybody else. Um, AP credits, when they transfer, you have classes um, already checked off the list. If you do a secondary portfolio instead of AP, that's not the case. They waive the class, but you need to pick out a substitute. I did not know that. So it's senior uh, year, and they were like, hey, do you want to take you know, your foundations elective that you're missing? And I'm like, don't make me do drawing three or something. I'm a senior, are you so, kidding? Oh, but I took a sketchbook class, and it was one of my favorites. So if anybody has the opportunity to take sketchbook, it's a good one. It's like a random foundations elective you can do. Same thing happened to me. Senior year, they're like, oh, yeah, you have this drawing one elective you need to make up. And I was like, uh, 
<laughs> but at the same time, I was able to work with my academic advisor and just take a CEQA elective class to like stick it in there. So like, really, you know, they wouldn't let me. That's interesting. Really? <laughs> oh, I I was friends with my academic advisor. We we met all the time because <laughs> I was obsessive. You had an in, Ness. You had an in. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Well, I guess it can go either way, but the sketchbook class was great, so no hard feelings. <laughs> yeah, because you, you might end up finding that you have a foundations class that you enjoy and one that will lead to another elective class. Like, you know, this isn't specifically, like, drawing related, but I, ha I had to take English, right, uh, at SCAD, and I ended up liking my professor so much that I ended up taking his my English elective with him, which was, like, this noir literature class, and it was, like, one of my favorites of, like, my whole time at SCAD. So, you know, there's blessings in disguise, if you will. Oh, yeah. So while we're talking about classes, though, um, does anybody want to give a lowdown on how the curriculum goes? Like, what are some classes that you get to look forward to after you survive intro? <laughs> well... So there's intro, there's also environments, props, and, uh, what's it called? Yes. Environments, props, and structures, yeah. Yeah, um, which is pretty essential to sequential art making. It's in it. essentially backgrounds, but also props, and it's, uh, at least in my experience, where you really learn to nail down perspective, which is also hugely important. Um, yeah, that, that, that whole class is super important, just because, you know, we're all kind of probably guilty of it where we don't like drawing backgrounds, we like drawing the characters. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's like, no, like the environments are arguably the most important part of comics. How many of us come from the background of saying, oh, I'm going to be a manga artist so I don't have to learn how to draw backgrounds. Never yeah, mind. I would leave. <laughs> Thank you. Oh my gosh. The worst. Environments is so hard, but it's a good one. Because mm -hmm. it's one of those, it's like, even the hardest classes, at least from, from my experience, even the hardest classes were still, like, a fun challenge, and you felt like you were learning stuff, something and getting better when you were doing them. So even stuff like environments, props, and structures, where I had to take it twice. I think I took it with Kennedy, but then I had to leave, and I think yeah, you and I right. had it together, Lisa. Um, we were in, like, like, the meeting room. Remember? Yeah, I don't feel great. like it was even one of the classrooms. It was like downstairs, extra space. Yeah, it's where like the teachers meet and have discussions. But I remember that one, like, you know, because I think it, I think in sequel you you get you you learn like really good habits from the professors and from the classes. Where I just like I just wanted to get better and I wanted to impress people and be happy with my work. And I think environments, props, and structures were where that really started to happen because I remember there was a there was a there was um one project where I think it was the one where like you had to like Gildersleeve was like you have to have two people get into a car and drive somewhere right do you remember that mm -hmm. and I, I didn't do that good I think I got a C on that one and I was like oh shit gotta you know gotta fix this gotta do gotta do better um, and it wasn't just a grade it was like I knew I could do better and so I, I motivated myself through that so which is a, a, basically a lesson if you want to get into sequential art is that you have to be good at self-motivating and just wanting to get better. So. Yeah, you definitely you have to be like to face your fears. I mean, you have to learn how to draw everything because it's it becomes a one-man job sometime. But Lively, what oh, were yeah. you saying? Oh, like it's if you phone it in, you know you're phoning it in, and you're gonna feel bad about it when critique comes, and you're like, oh, I could have really done better. And you like, you know, like like Taylor said, you learn to do better, like or the betterment of your own art. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say uh, look forward to the concept art electives you can take. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I also super, super, super shout out, major shout out, enjoyed uh, the script writing class with Nice. There are mm -hmm. two of them. There's intro and advance. And the man is a legend and super good at what he does. And I... Love, I love the writing class. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, yes, he is. <laughs> Staff master supreme, Mark Neese. And he's my just, favorite. He's like the war veteran who's seen everything, and he's fantastic. <laughs> he's really but you know, you know, 
Love him, yeah. He'll be he'll get a script in the class that's like clearly like a sonic fan fiction and he just gets like a thousand yards. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. He's like one of the first teachers to crush your weeaboo spirit. Like he really is. <laughs> yeah, he's like, so, like so funny. <laughs> and when he like listens to your Sonic the Hedgehog pitch and then he like slowly folds into himself and he's like, uh <laughs> stop. The biggest problem is so many kids, and I'm sure we will address this many times over by the end of this talk, but so, so many kids come into SCAD being like, well, I have this 300 and whatever page chapter story that I've been writing since I was 12, and just you wait, let me tell you all about it, and no, no, <laughs> no. It's Space is here to say your space operas. Are we allowed to we... <laughs> Just tell bite-sized stories, and if you want to tell the story, tell it in the correct medium, and listen to Nice. he will help you understand and see. See the light. Yeah. Exactly. Because that's that's another thing I've really gleaned from the the course is just how to compress storytelling. Because yes, I think um, it's just so common for people to just want to like like stretch it out over like ten pages when it could be five six pages. And I think I read on I think it was from like Riley Brown, who's uh, a professional artist working on. He did like Deadpool and stuff. And I think he he had this great bit of advice where you know when you do a pro a, a project, make sure that the it's probably best that the page count doesn't surpass the amount of pages you've made previously combined. So like let's say you've done thirty pages of comics up to that point. Don't try and you know stretch yourself and try to do thirty one or thirty five in one project, because chances are you're probably going to get burned out, probably going to not finish it. So, you know, you got to build up to it. You know, work on short stories, work on um, pitches and stuff like that. And that's that's why, like, if, if you want to get into traditional print comics, that's why, um, you know, issues are so good because you're starting, you know, you're doing them in 20-some-odd page increments. And even, like, web comics, you know, you're just you're doing a page, a couple pages a week, right? So you're, you're never going to really get you know, burnt out doing that because you got all this time to plan, all this time to prepare and stuff like that, so. Well, I mean, you can still get burnt out doing that, but, you know. Yeah. You'll know what you're doing at least a little bit more, doing, you know, starting out with smaller chunks as opposed to immediately attacking your 300-page space opera comic. <laughs> yeah, you got to know how to pace yourself. And then you might even find out that you don't really... Uh, work well with the rigors of what comics um, ask for, and that doesn't have to be a bad thing, because honestly that's what I settled with myself when I decided not to do animation. I'm thinking what this is going to demand is not something I want to offer, so if you don't like drawing or you don't like um, drawing every little thing and putting everything in an environment and writing out the story, if there are parts of it that you don't like, you can get around some of it and like team up with people, but at the end of the day, there's no weaseling out of it. <laughs> like you said, Lee, if you phone it in, like people are gonna know. So I was wondering, what were some of the electives that you guys took um, in the sequential department? Well, that's like the concept art elective. <laughs> on who shoes their sin. <laughs> that was also one of my favorite ones up there. Um, the professor, I don't think she's there anymore. Uh, Melissa, Natalie, a curtain. Um, yeah, I think I don't think she's uh, at SCAD anymore, or maybe she's te teaching uh, online classes. But um, yeah, that was definitely one of the my favorite electives. Although it ironically doesn't really have a lot to do directly with comics, I feel like a lot of the stuff that I learned in there kind of carried over as far as like being able to quickly draw out or quickly illustrate an idea or quickly you know set a scene. Um, like, or a, a mood very quickly within one piece of art or one panel. So, yeah. concept art one, yeah, definitely. Yeah, piggybacking off that concept's awesome. There's an intro class, an advanced class. I took intro with Mia Goodwin, advanced with Melissa Curtin. They're both crazy talented. Like, uh, it, it will, hopefully, if the curriculum has not changed, it will kick your ass up and down. <laughs> And uh, I recently got to have a like conversation with Mia Goodwin lately. She's 
working off in the industry, kicking ass. And uh, I think, yeah, I think, huh? She's uh, doing Tomboy. Uh, for those of you like keeping up with the like floppies, she's with Action Lab doing, which is apparently doing Gangbusters. I still haven't it's got amazing. to read it yet. But. Yeah, it's like, it's like crazy. Popular. I just got issue five. But that's her. That's not her day job. She's currently a concept artist full time at Retro Studios in Texas too. Like on top of everything. Um, but I just had a conversation with her, and we both agreed that like SCAD creates workhorses, just people who can sit down, <laughs> grind out the work, and you know, get it done no matter what needs to get done. So those concept artists or concept elective classes are awesome at just. Sometimes being the first class to really kick your ass, and you need that, whether you know it or not. I forget how many electives did we get. I think you get three within your own major, and then you get three to go explore. <laughs> yeah, I think I I only yeah. remember two of them, unfortunately. But, <laughs> like um, uh, one of them was the anatomy class that I mentioned, which has uh, Dove McArdue as the professor. And that was great because, again, it's, it's that co continuation of the life drawing, but you're, like, you know, applying it to, to comics. And what's great is that you get a second Liefeld day because in his main, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, um, foundation sequential class, he does Liefeld day where instead of – what Dove usually does every class day is that he'll present an artist, show you their art to kind of help, one, make you kind of sad because – you, you feel like you suck compared to them, but also to motivate you. But then he'll show you Rob Life. There's it's like it's basically like, you know, it should be a national holiday, let's face it. Um, where he, he just he just brings in all this Liefeld Rob Liefeld art. If you don't know Rob Liefeld, you should Google him and his awful atrocious art because it's amazing. <laughs> it's oh, I forgot I can screen share. Why don't I do that while you keep talking? <laughs> oh my god. And I did like and he was I remember for the final project, um, <laughs> I ended up just doing like uh, an anatomy overlay on one of his co his covers for the New Fifty Two, which was like Hawk and Dove, and it was it was fascinating, like dissecting how awful the anatomy was. So. Oh, I want to see that. <laughs> yeah, it, it's I forget where I put it. It might be somewhere. So there's <laughs> that. And then uh, Lisa can attest to this because we had the children's book class together. Which was, yeah, is that, is that the life felt? <laughs> oh my gosh, though. I like that oh. Dove made a point of saying that, you know, oh, we make fun of his faces, but, you know, he kind of, yeah. there's a resemblance. <laughs> can, you, can you look up Rob Liefeld, Hawk and Dove? Well, I'm just going Oh, no. <laughs> so they know exactly what I'm talking about. It's, yeah, it's, the, it's like the number one, the first issue cover for that. Is it this one right here, or? Let's see. Yeah, well, that's that's the book. Yeah, I don't know why they don't have the cover on there. Probably just because it like bleeds into all his other art that he does. Because it's just like generic poses with arms flailing and angry scours and no pupils in the eyes. And does he does he still draw like this? Does anybody know? I, I, I well, that's the thing about the Hawk and Dove one is that that's from like 2011. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's why I chose it. Like, it's not as apparently bad. But when you have to like kind of stop and look, and then you're like, oh man, it's still really, really bad. Oh good, that's where this came from, y'all. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're gonna look at some good art now. We're gonna look at your guys' stuff. Keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, my favorite elective, I think, was um, hand lettering. Actually, it was just it was really different and. I had absolutely atrocious handwriting before I took it, and then I like completely relearned how to write. Cause you're sort of drawing each letter. He like Professor Duncan like goes over each letter. He's like, today we're going to look at the letter A, and it sounds like it should be boring, but it's actually really really fun. And then you have to do a comic that's mostly in the dark, which is kind of a cool challenge. Mm -hmm. So, Lisa, do you want to talk about the children's book class? Oh, yeah, what were you saying about that? Well, I just, I just, I just you know, kind of threw it at you. Like, that was, that's probably the most, what, might be my favorite class I ever took there because I have this, like, tangible thing. Because we actually put together and made our children's books um, into, like, physical products. 
Yeah, and, I can't even describe how rewarding that is because you do so much um, digital work in sequential too that you lose touch with anything tangible sometimes. And then it was so nice just to have a physical book at the end of it. You work hard, man. Um, I'm going to throw some shade at the illustration students. Don't pretend that y'all didn't know it was coming. <laughs> there are two, there are two classes time. that you can take. Um, you can take the illustration uh, children's book elective, or you can take the one in CEQA. In CEQA, you not only make this book, um, like, plan it out and everything and draw it, you bring it to completion, you print it out, you stitch it together like the last day of class, the illustration students, I think you guys only had to turn in a PDF of your sketches. Correct me if I'm wrong. Oh, oh my god, really? <laughs> There's, uh, I feel like, well, how did this saying go? And while I was going to school, it was uh, animation mm, no. Illustration students are just lazy sequentials, and sequentials are just lazy animation students. I have no problem with that statement. I think it's true. <laughs> well, it's kind of like the whole, like, you know, a square is a rectangle, but a rectangle is not a square thing, where I feel yeah. like CEQA, CEQA students can do what illustration does, but illustration students can't necessarily do... Uh, transfer. Because mm -hmm. yeah. I remember in, I think, Viz 1, I had with Lo, and there was this, this poor girl who was an, illus uh, an illustration major. She might have been a... Um, like a grad student, and she was she had to take this class, and she just did. It was, she was just so in over her head, her head. It was crazy, and I felt so bad because it's like she, it was just because that's not the stuff that she she's used to, and not like how she thinks. You know, you know, you just it's just a different mindset and way of thinking and storytelling and stuff. Yeah, which storytelling, I feel like that word is key because I think that might be like the main difference is that um, I mean. You can be a really fantastic artist technique-wise, but that may not necessarily make you a good sequential artist because, I mean, the act of storytelling, like, there's a lot more to it than just pretty pictures, essentially. Mm -hmm. It's like having it flow from one panel to the next coherently, you know, um, is stuff that you learn in sequential, is stuff that mm -hmm. you learn when you get stomped all over by Professor Nice, your first... <laughs> <laughs> crushes well, your I weed also, fantasy. I, I, so I also think that... Jumping off of that, like, storytelling not only is the key word <laughs> in the difference between kind of the majors, but also comics and sequential art is so psychological, and readers don't even know, like, that they're being led through a mm. story, and you artists need to understand, or, or just as a visual designer, need to understand how to convey a story visually, yeah. sometimes often without words, and lead them, maybe lead their eye through a scene, and that doesn't really get taught in, like, traditional fine arts. Um, mm -hmm. Very that's why, unique. That's why support. perspective is so important, because yeah. it's like Lo said, it's all about the diagonals, and I, I, I always use that, like, all these diagonals to lead um, the reader's eye. eye. Yeah, to lead the eye. So <laughs> You should, like, Lisa, you need to, like, look up a picture of Lo. Just so people know who this man is. <laughs> just <laughs> just add him on Facebook. Man. Everybody in the chat, you don't know who he is, but just <laughs> add Lowe on Facebook. You will not regret it. <laughs> no, did you guys ever play the game that was like, find Low in Norris, and you just go quiet and listen for the yelling? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's great. Oh. Yeah. The following voice that's like... Yeah. I remember, like, I, I, I would probably be on, like, two floors ahead of him. Like, I'd be, like, down the hall from him. I'd be like, hey, Taylor, how's it going? <laughs> and I'd just hear him, and it would just resonate through poor old Norris. Yeah. My favorite love story is I had him at 8 a.m. for an inking class, and um, he just has no indoor voice, you know. I hope he's watching this right now, by the way. But <laughs> he's sounding all the time, and that has to be a strain on his voice. And then he was telling us some story about, like, how his doctor said that, like, he should not yell all the time or something. He's just like, I think something's really wrong with my throat, but he's screaming while he's saying it. We're just like, take it easy. It's okay. <laughs> how I talk. Zero chill. Oh, I'm looking at the chat. Your mom said something really sweet, Lively. Aw. What? I don't your mom's there, yeah. Sorry to embarrass you. <laughs> no, that's fine. I don't know how to get to it, though. <laughs> oh, if you click the link on my uh, Facebook page, you should be able to see it. Oh, yeah. wow, my phone really hot. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, 
we have too many too many professor stories. That could be its own segment. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> with classes, though, what one do you guys think was the most challenging, and then what was your favorite? The two can be the same, maybe. Probably not, though. <laughs> Because for me, I don't think it gets much harder than Viz 2, but what do you guys think? Oh, God. That was pretty much what my first thought was going to be. It was Viz 2 or, um, or the concept class. It's, yeah, which for, as far as Viz 2 is, you guys want to fill them in, I guess? Yeah, yeah. I would say I would, I would agree with Viz 2. I would say Viz 2 and children's book illustration uh, combined, um, especially because I had those in back-to-back -back quarters. So it was like one huge project, and then it's like, oh man, spring break, and then another huge project. Um, yeah, so so basically, what you you have these two classes, which uh, was it visual storytelling one and two, right? And mm. their nicknames are Viz one and two, and they're basically just continuations of what you learn in intro, um, and it's all about you're you're actually making comic pages, you're you're getting scripts, you're working from scripts, you're making four-page stories, five-page stories, six-page stories, whatever. And that's in, Viz, that's in Viz 1, at least my Viz 1. I don't know if I had Viz 1 when, when any of you guys, but that was with Lo. And so, so basically, he would basically just take segments of a script from like a, a, a published, published book, and he would work from that. I think my favorite um, project from, from Viz 1 was where we exchanged... Um, scripts with the writing class. So from oh. Nisa's scripting class, we, we worked from people's scripts in that. So that was cool. And so I was, how many drawings of Sonic the Hedgehog did you have to do? <laughs> uh, thankfully, only 17. Uh, so, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> I mean, it was really weird. It was a Western comic, so it was like Sonic in the Old West. That was weird. I don't know. <laughs> Sonic. So um, the thing that was the most frustrating about the visual storytelling 2 class, by the way, is the fact that you basically have to redraw the same story about four times over the course of the semester. So you draw it this one time, and then, you know, you get the critique, and you do your feedback, and then it's, uh, you basically push it to, uh, like, find new ways to redraw the same story all over again. And so by the time that you do this, you're just so sick of the story that you you're so sick of this <laughs> So my answer is probably predictable, um, but I was freelancing at the same time as Viz 2, and the intro to concept start elective still kicked my ass more. So I actually I actually had to look it up. Yeah, I actually had to look it up for the intro to concept art. You do 50 composition studies, 50 film studies, on and and pages like 50 pages of a sketchbook. On top of the actual, oh yeah, no, this was like OG intro to concept. Uh, on top of like two production illustrations, multiple character turnaround sheets, I think two or three, uh, five full environments on top of another like hundred thumbnails for environments. I think we had to detail out five props, but then also have like, no, three props, but then also have five sheets of prop sheets that weren't detailed and cut like. It was a lot, and and it was awesome, and it kicks your ass, and it turns you into the workhorse that you're meant that to be. The, that was the one with um with Mia, right? Yes. No, not, yeah. not with, okay, that's right. I don't remember it. I was yeah, 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 yeah. That was uh, Mia's curriculum, which I'm sure was just padded, and it was it was awesome. But yeah, yeah it was the hardest it was. class I've ever had, and it was awesome. It was also my favorite. That's amazing that something gets harder than Viz 2. Wow. Because yeah. it is. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then I got to Viz 2. I needed wrist like... surgery. Shh. I believe it. Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, you guys described that it, um, you revisit this one story that you write four different times, um, which is already strenuous enough, but the deadlines for it are unlike anything I've done. It's amazing. The first, uh, you have a week with two classes, um, and between the first class and the second, you know, you're supposed to have an idea of what you're doing, but over the weekend, you basically thumbnailed out, you know, what did you do, like 40 different thumbnails of how it's supposed to go, because you had to, like, visit it at different ways with different panels, and you can't reuse anything, and then right after that, it's like the next day you have to have those pages drawn and finished, like, for tight roughs, and it's, 
<gasps> there's no time. You are only given enough time to be able to do it. There is no yeah. wiggle room at all. Because I, I did most of those assignments in 24 hours each, and I actually did need wrist surgery after that. It's a oh. terrible idea. Like, get time management early and, like, figure out your limits. Oh yeah, sorry. It's like my mute might it or mic muted. Can't speak. I did. Sorry, I'm reading the chat. I didn't know that that J.K. Simmons was Tenzin in Legend yeah. of Korra. Oh yeah, <laughs> dropping truth bombs on you. Whoa. I mean, I knew it was him in Gravity Falls without a doubt, but no, in that makes Gravity so much Falls. more sense now. He's the dude in the farmer's insurance commercials. I knew that because you yeah. can see him, but I did not recognize his voice. Wow. Okay. He's, he's omnipresent. Wait, did you um, say that you had your niece muted? Did I hear that right? What's that? I feel like I heard you say that you had your niece muted instead of your mic muted. Like your I mic. did. Oh, I okay. That, <laughs> that was good. Doing too many things at once, man. Um, let me see what else. Thinking, oh, um, a lot of people want to know how much materials cost for classes. I mean, we don't have to break down the prices, but at least... Um, is there enough time in the day? To <laughs> there is not. So everybody in unison, <laughs> what class costs the most? It's either foundations or it's materials and techniques, right? <laughs> that class, but, you but experiment so much. Yeah. But all the stuff you get for materials and techniques you use for every other sequential class following yeah. it. So it's, you know, you yeah, it's kind of like the class that you take to just build up all the stuff and learn how to use all the stuff, and then you apply that stuff. So I would say I spent way more on, like, foundations, like charcoal and paper. Yeah. And, like, the good... Like, I was very picky about my Bristol board, so I probably spent more on Bristol boards than, like, you know, the ink and materials and stuff. But mm -hmm. you just... You have to make an investment and then you use those materials like and buy the good stuff don't be like if you can afford it like really don't be cheap about it because then you learn with the good stuff and while you might think that's a waste it's really teaching you more and you'll be maybe more careful with it so it carries you through the rest of your classes in at SCAD and then possibly into freelance that you'll maybe be doing at the same time or doing after graduation like it's an investment and you just sometimes have to suck it up sadly <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, because at least then you've, like, built up stock of everything and you have it for forever after, hopefully. Yeah. I've still got Bristol from college. <laughs> I'm just sad that they don't do the trade show anymore, because everybody freshman year, I guess, got all their stuff at the yeah, trade yeah. show. Yeah. Yeah. Art supplies, yeah, no. Yeah. I forgot about that. <laughs> um... I don't use any of those materials that I bought in uh, in art school. BT dubs, just throwing that out there. I replaced it all with this twenty five hundred dollars antique. You're never gonna use pastels again. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Maybe not pastels or the graphite stick, though. Oh, there yeah, are benefits yeah. to doing traditional stuff. I mean, you guys saw the pages from Goth Western. That looks so beautiful. Teach me how to do that, legally. <laughs> uh, and and Kyle Photoshop brushes. Is it? It looks yeah. traditional. That's amazing. It's the watercolor set that he has. It's, it's really great. It's like, I forget how much it costs. They're like pay brushes, but you get so much for your money. It's awesome. Yeah, pay brushes are generally pretty cheap and well worth the cost. No way. I thought it was ink wash and like Prismacolor. That is amazing. Yep. Good job. You're fooling yeah, us all. <laughs> People on Topastic keep being like, what are you using to make this? Yeah, it's all digital. Nice. So what um, what classes do you think prepared you guys the most for your career or whatever um, you've been working on since graduation? What classes helped you the most with um, figuring out how to do all that? Is that about to say the concept art class again? <laughs> <Is> that <laughs> No, that's not necessarily true. I feel like uh, probably the, uh, uh, what's it called, senior project. So your last quarter, your second to last quarter, you take, um, well, it's called senior project. You can basically decide, you know, what it is that you're going to be working on the quarter. But depending on your professor, 
they'll also kind of give you a bit of a crash course on freelancing. Like they'll talk about taxes, how to do invoicing, how to do resume, all that you know stuff that you probably should have learned way earlier in the curriculum. But yeah, I wish we had so much longer to talk about that because that was something that I didn't feel quite so prepared for. That's probably the, my biggest criticism of the the majors that there isn't a class like that. There should there should be a class. There is there, a class. There is, but it's an did elective. Did you guys right? did you guys not take? Well, it's it's publishing and self publishing. Oh, uh, I wanted I to take that. I didn't have. Oh, yeah. yeah, unfortunately, it's an elective. Yeah. But I took it with Fish, uh, Anthony Fisher, when he was still able to teach and not like the dean. Dean. Yeah. Um, but he's he was awesome. I mean, that's where you do. You make your portfolio. You make your resume. You talk about pitching. You practice pitching. You practice interviewing. Uh, I guess that's another one to highly recommend. And see, that's the thing is that like that should be a required course if you yeah, ask me. Probably. You I really feel like, yeah, at least you know some kind of basic semblance of. Uh, Self-employed crash course of some kind. Yeah, I feel like it's just a freelancing class, like how to how to balance your budget and. thing, like I mean, like a art school thing in general. I feel like there should be a bit of a more focus on that. But. Well, you can even go back to like high school and how we don't know how to like do. I don't know how to do my taxes, but I, I know I can quote you some Pythagorean theorem. Mm, I love me some algebra. <laughs> exactly. I think maybe the reason it ends up that way is just with our major, there was so much material we had to get through, like so many stepping stones of classes that there's no more room to fit in like one last class, so I guess that's why they made it an elective, because it's like right yeah. before senior project, ideally, aren't you taking one of your electives and then um, Viz 2 or something like that, so there's no tapering off point. You like hit the brakes and slam into senior project and then you fall off the cliff, so... <laughs> I'll also say I really enjoyed uh, the pitch uh, with Goto. Uh, I think it's a winter-only yeah. class. Yeah, like winter winter. Only. yeah, and he, like, in that one, you basically make a contract with the professor and be like, this is what I'm going to deliver you, and he's going to be like, and he'll either be like, yes, that's what you'll deliver to me at the end of the quarter. He'll be like, no, no, you, you need three times that much or twice, you know. So you work out kind of your own curriculum, and it lets you basically be, like, have the time in your student schedule to be like, oh my god, this is what's missing for my portfolio, this is what I'm going to do this quarter. And, uh, I mean, a lot of my advice is just talk to your professors and, like, work with your professors, because they've seen it all before, they've heard it all before, many of them have been through it all before as students. So, like, just talk it out with them. See, like, what you need, or if you're, like, hey, I'm a senior now, and I literally, like, don't know how to put together a resume, which I would hope you do, or, like, I literally don't know about freelancing taxes. Like, Melissa Curtin was awesome about that and, like, spent half of our advanced concept art class just being like, this is how you budget. This is how you budget for student loans. This is how you budget for a car and a house. And, like, helped talk us through that, which I was not expecting, but it was so, so nice. And it's because it was a senior level, like, 400-level class. It was awesome. But it's the professors, really. Well, that's the thing, too, is that what's great, and I'm sure this is probably true in a lot of other majors, too, but you're going to basically have a much deeper relationship and friendship with your with most of, if not all, of your professors. It's, I mean, it's not like high school where you just kind of go in, you do your thing, and you leave. Like, no, you. It, it's part of the networking aspect, too, is that, you know... I think, I like to think that the price tag of SCAD, which, I mean, you could debate about if it's worth it or not until your face turns blue, but I think you're also paying for the for the experience and the networking aspects you get, because, I mean, look at us, we're all classmates, we're still talking to each other two years <laughs> later, you know, so you're building, you're networking great, and, you know, you build friendships and camaraderie going into different industries that you're going to maintain for as long as possible, and the same, like, I still I still talk to my professors when I was working on Skeleton Bay Detective Agency, which was the Kickstarter we mentioned way back when. Um, I sent stuff out to you know John Larison and Kit Seaton and stuff like that, and get their opinions on it. it it's really no different because you know now you're kind of their peer now that you're graduated. You know you're working in the industry, so you're their peer. They they're there to help you even though you're not their student anymore. So. Yeah, thanks so much for bringing that up, because that is a really good point, that, like, 
it's all about connections, and mm -hmm. there's so many people, I think, who, yeah, like to get on your case and be like, well, can't you just teach yourself to draw? Aren't there enough tutorials online? It's like, yeah, but sometimes you need somebody to crack the whip, so it's good to have a professor to, like, guide you through things and ask questions there directly instead of type to somebody online, because it'll be instantaneous, and it's also great that they have people come right to campus in the fields that you would like to be hired to, so... Yeah. Yeah, like we just did Editor's Day a couple of weeks ago. Those, uh, were you guys there? Any of you um, at the Editor's Day event? Didn't make it down this year, but it's always a good experience. Yeah, it, there's some other regrets. I, I feel like I didn't take full advantage of Editor's Day, and I feel like I did. I felt like, personally, I got kind of screwed over in my senior Editor's Day because I only got to see two people um, instead of three. Because I think, and it just happened, you know, I think the third person I was supposed to be with canceled like the second day or whatever. So it was like but I was bummed about it and but yeah, like editor's day, even even if and, and part of it too is that I, I started I took intro later than most people. So by the time editor's day was coming I really didn't have anything worth showing. So I didn't feel like so it really it, it really wasn't worthwhile that year. But because um, I think I took intro in sophomore year when a lot of people take it end of freshman year. And and so I did it um, junior and senior year. So, um, but if you can try and take it, you know, as many years as you can, and try to have work that you can show with Editor's Day. I um, actually should we talk should we talk about what Editor's Day is. Oh yeah, <laughs> a little bit. I'll save a little bit though for um, I think the third discussion panel um, I'm gonna do will just only be about Editor's Day, so oh. we'll save the big points of it. But yeah, if somebody can give an overview. Uh, essentially, you... it's editors from um, some pretty major uh, publishing companies come to the school. They do portfolio reviews, both one-on-one -on -one reviews with you and um, group reviews, and. Um, so some of the ones that came this past year were like DC, um, Oni Press, Boom Studio. No wait, uh, Boom wasn't one of the ones that came, but but you get the idea. And and they get some big people. Like I remember the first year, I think it was my sophomore year or our sophomore year, and you had Marvel people, DC people, Vertigo people, Dark Horse people. Like I didn't get it. I didn't do an interview, but I did go to the panel because there's a panel too, and. Even if you don't have work to show them, go to the panel because it's going to have a lot of tips and there's a great Q and A and all that kind of stuff. Plus, you get to see uh, Brian Ralph be the MC, so which is always a treat. <laughs> <laughs> Ralph. Yeah, because even if you don't walk away from Editor's Day with something lined up immediately, the connection alone, like the fact that you met with um, this person in the industry, can be so significant. I'm really realizing that now because. Um, Somebody came to visit um, SCAD and is now my current editor for what I'm working on. So it was just like, oh, hey, remember two years ago when you visited my college? I was the blonde girl in back being kind of weird. Yeah, let's work together. <laughs> so well, I those say, connections can really turn into something. Even, even more, well, maybe on the same part, as making connections with the people you're showing your portfolio to, you're also, like, showing your portfolio is a skill. And you are building on that skill. And I always used to tell freshmen, I don't give a damn what is or isn't in your portfolio or what you have. Just apply to Editor's Day. I don't care if you're, like, so intimidated you can't say two words. Good. You need to actually work on that and show your stuff. And if your excuse over and over and over and over again is just, like, oh, well, it's not ready. Well, guess what? It's never going to be ready. I've been working in the games industry for three, four years. My portfolio still isn't ready. It just, just show your stuff because you're never gonna show it otherwise. So get your butt to editor's day. Like, just do it. I don't, I don't care your excuses. Notice that we're all vigorously nodding right now. <laughs> yeah, just do it. Just show your stuff. <laughs> I confess I only did Editor's Day, like, um, my sophomore year, and then this past year as an alumni, I skipped out on, like, pretty much all of the past previous years to probably to my discredit, or to, you know, discredit. Yeah, it's, it's, it's similar to, like, me, I would say, where it's, like, um, yeah, like, to kind of, for proof of what Ness is saying, too, is, like, you know, I, I kind of made the excuse, even though, I mean, 
I had maybe two pages to show, but I'm yeah. Um, if you make sure, try to even make stuff outside of class for editor's day, mm-hmm. you know, and put that in your portfolio. Um, and 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 for editor's day, make sure you have pages. Yes. Don't yeah. bring pinups. Don't bring covers. Pages. Trying to just less, uh, you know, just more sequential pages of actual storytelling than mm-hmm. your pinups and yeah. splash illustrations. Those are fine, just you know, as long as they're not the majority. Because yeah. again, there's a difference between art, uh, illustration, and sequential. Yeah, and yeah. that's a big part of it. Yes. Yes. Weebly, <laughs> did you have anything to add about Editor's Day? Not really. I think you guys covered it. <laughs> Yeah, the people in the chat really liked, um, Christina, they liked your words of wisdom. Yeah! So, yeah. <laughs> also, your mom is being such a great moderator right now, Leavely. I really appreciate it. She's <laughs> the mom mod. I looked at the chat, so I haven't been, like, mom mod. <laughs> She'll get her check in the mail later for being my moderator. <laughs> yeah. um, did any of you guys ever go to the career fair? Did you only do Editor's Day? I only did Editor's Day. I did to the career fair more years than I did the Editor's Day, and I really feel like Editor's Day was more like effective than career fair. Career fair is kind of a mess. Um, for those of you that don't go, to, it's it's a swarm like every day. Like it's just they release the floodgates of students, you know, one class level at a time. It's just like stampeding towards all these these tiny booths of prospective employers. It's not fun. Yeah, that's what's cool, because that's the difference, but is really, like, Editor's Day is made for us as a major. Career yeah. Fair is just kind of a, a wild goose chase, all free-for-all. And I never went, and a lot of that has to do from just word of mouth, where I would have friends that went in, like, animation or film, and they're just like, yeah, no, don't. It's, it's just a big, you know, cluster, you know what, so. Yeah. yeah. I mostly went looking for, like, illustration or design stuff. I don't know. It was a lot of it was really focused on advertising, I guess. Advertising is like graphic design in that area, which is less of interest to me. Yeah. Well, I'll say I went to Editor's Day for four years, and I went to the Career Fair for four years, uh, freshman through senior, and I got one little one-time gig off of Editor's Day, and I got one little one-time gig off of Career Fair kind of like both senior year, but I think, again, like I've already ranted, the experience you get from learning how to present and show your portfolio and conduct yourself in front of an industry professional is more important as a student than actually getting jobs. That's true. Yeah, I agree. Like, I did still do career fair all four years. It's just that, I mean... Yeah, it's a shot because even yeah. if that gig, you know, that you get at from career fair may potentially lead to more down the road. So I mean, it's still worth the shot. It's just you know, keep in mind that it's also going to be a stampede. So just so you know. Yes, prepare. <laughs> Wear high heels. Learn that my junior year. Oh my gosh, I know that's that's the difficult like line that we walk. I think those of us who might be wanting to wear heels or anything to go with our outfit, because it's like you can't dress too, um, prof- not professionally, you should look professional, but know where you're going and who you're going to talk to. Like, don't show up like you're looking to go to prom, <laughs> I guess. But also don't, like, you know, roll out of bed and show up in your beat-up Nirvana shirt. Like, yeah. well, there's a lot of that. <laughs> several hours at a time sometimes depending on who you're going to you're standing around all day basically so that and so striking that middle ground between you know not falling out the six inch heels but also not you know rolling up in a t-shirt and stained cargo pants anyway <laughs> well, I'm not talking about anybody in particular but they know who they are <laughs> they know who they are. let's see Talked about the career fair. Are there any um, sequential showcases that we have during the year? I don't know if we really have, um, like, a senior show or an exhibit or anything. At least nothing I went to. Did I miss something? Uh, Sometimes the grads organize one on their own. Like, they all get together and just proactively, like, there's... Because Savannah 
has a bunch of artists in it. There's also a bunch of gallery spaces and like coffee shops that show artwork. It's like a really cool art-infused city to live in. Um, and I know that uh, I think our senior year, a bunch of the grads kind of just friended, bonded together and like rented out a gallery space and had a little show and hung their stuff. And it was really nice. And like, there's nothing against being proactive and doing something with your friends, even cross major like so. Yeah, yeah. So it would be something, if there was anything, it would be something like that and not something official like the film festival or anything like that. Or, right, yeah. Yeah, the yeah. fashion show or the animation show or whatever. Yeah, it, and, but I think it helps because it, it teaches you to be self-sufficient as a comic artist. Like, you know, if you want to get your stuff out there, you got to work to get it out there. And, but you also have plenty of like-minded people that will help you get it out there if you find them. There was the the mini comics expo one year. I think senior year maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember who organized it. I just showed up kind of at the last minute, but that was really good. I liked that lot. I think also SCAD has finally started doing their own convention of sorts. Yeah, like they do. Yeah, 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 which is a great idea. Why wasn't that a thing well, sooner? Well, I remember there was supposed to be one across the river over in the convention center there or whatever, but that never came to fruition. So, and of course, after we graduate, there's SwarmCon. <laughs> it's like, oh, thanks. Okay, I think, cool. I think we did SwarmCon um, our senior year. It's just kind of a, a not a fully... You know, articulate. It was, small. It was kind of. It was pretty small, yeah. But. It was probably during like Fun you know time. finals or some crap. Oh, they did that in the spring, right? So I was out. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. All you new kids, man. You have all the good stuff. <laughs> Except we <laughs> had our own building. We had our own yeah. building, and you're stuck with other people. <laughs> R.I.P. Norris. <laughs> oh my gosh, that beautiful pink building gone it's forever. Apparently no longer pink. It's not pink anymore. Yeah, they, it's not? It's not pink anymore. They made it yeah. over. It's not, um, yeah, all the sequential majors got moved to, um, what's it called, Heyman's Hall? Heyman. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so Morris Norris Hall is not the sequential part. And, and I think fashion, fashion or apparel design is in Morris now, so. Oh, really? The Morris is in, and the Norris is, yeah, they're all in oh. Heyman. Illustration from Heyman with Sequa. Oh. Boy, I bet that's a fun building. No. Times have changed. I'm picturing I think it's pretty like Jeff sells her for it's like. Yeah, I've seen <laughs> like like friends of, that I know that are still at SCAD, like them talking about like the little the little like microaggressions between <laughs> <laughs> illustration. For real though. Like, if anybody who put their to who put their wet like illustration piece in the scanner, you know. <laughs> 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 There is a lot of aggression between those two majors, if anybody wanted to know. War. And I'm sure the animation people feel hostile towards us at times, too. But really, like, I'll be on the bus sometimes. Like, it's one thing for us to make fun of ever other people in our major, because it's like there are, there are people, you know, we're all one of a kind. And then it's just like when somebody, when you're like, oh, look at all these nerds with their Pikachu backpacks and their cat ears, a bunch of weeaboos. And then somebody's like, I know, man, anime sucks. And you're just like, get out. <laughs> Step off, man. They're my people. We start snapping like we're in West Side Snort Story. <laughs> yeah. That's how we fight between majors, yeah. yeah. Get out of here with your non moving pictures. <laughs> exactly. Good. Okay, I want to make sure that we have some time for question and answer, so I will ask our last question, which is always my favorite. What are your biggest praises of the sequential department and your biggest criticisms? Let loose and get my channel shut down. <laughs> <laughs> Everything to both. <laughs> um. No one wants to go first. Nobody wants to go first. <laughs> uh. I think my biggest um, praise of the department is kind of like we said, like it's a, a bit of a familial thing, like because it's, it's kind of a smaller one, it's like, um, it's kind of close-knit as far as like um, letting people know about, you know, jobs and opportunities that are out there. Um, I feel like that's maybe not the case in other majors as much, um, so that's the, the cool thing about it. 
my criticisms about sequential art. Let me let me roll out my scroll for a <laughs> You're like a old parchment. <laughs> um, hear ye, hear ye. I don't know if I have uh, a whole lot of. Uh, I mean, like I said, I really think there should be um, like a, a focus on um, learning to conduct self-employed business like early on in the curriculum, like as far as freelancing, taxes, and all that stuff. Like I feel like that should be more of a required thing as opposed to an elective. But um, other than that, off the top of my head, come back around to me. I'm sure I'll find something to complain about. <laughs> uh, I'll say the thing. I liked the most about the sequential department uh, is like professors and then the networking connections you make uh, with students. I think Taylor kind of laid it all out earlier. Yes, SCAD is expensive, but you're not just buying a degree or learning how to draw. You're also getting not only the crazy alumni connections that are awesome. Like when I started at uh, Runic, the current game studio I'm at, they had, had had a history of SCAD alumni who all had worked really hard so they already really liked graduates from the school and I'm working with a current alumni who graduated way before I started but we're like, oh yeah, SCAD, we both lived in O-House, let's, you know, be friends over it. It's awesome. Um, and the professors are all super knowledgeable. You're not only learning how to draw, you're learning how to draw from people who are also currently still working and learning in the industry and willing to like pass on that advice. Um, I can't speak for everyone's point of view, but I would pay it all over again like to get that knowledge and connections and like in my brain. Yeah. Um, I would also say the biggest criticism is, I mean I think we've all been touching on and Kennedy said it well, like, uh, I think there's also maybe this thought or this desire throughout the entire school that when you graduate you're gonna get a full-time position, benefits, great, you know, st enough pay to like, you know, keep you afloat and you'll be doing what you love and that's kind of obviously the goal and the dream and everyone works towards that, but I don't necessarily think I think that the industry is constantly changing, especially in games and comics, um, and that it's more likely that you'll get a job either con contracting, which has an end date, or freelancing, which also has a much shorter end date to your work. And so preparing for the reality of entering a job industry where you're probably going to be freelancing and contracting and not doing something full-time, um, I think that's something that students and professors should work together to understand because I think even if a professor is preaching freelance, 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 you're still, I would have been that snot-nosed, stubborn I for a long time. So just get that knowledge and probably hammer it in a little bit more. Yeah, I didn't think about it till now, but we're probably one of the majors that knows like a ton about freelancing. Yeah. Lively, you're next. <laughs> uh, next. Um, let's see. Yeah, I think I think definitely um, what Christina was saying like earlier earlier about making us into workhorses is probably one of the biggest strengths that you get at SCAD because like I don't know, it's just something about it has has made me just determined to stay on my goals and just keep on going. Like, I've been updating my webcomic continuously despite, like, ongoing ridiculous computer problems. And I think a lot of that is due to, like, the, the training I got at SCAD. Um, and, yeah, I think also I would have benefited from more of that, like, real-world advice that came almost, like, only at the end. And definitely more of a, like, I wish that in intro they had come up to you and been like, hey, here's a bunch of exercises for your hand and wrist and, like, your back and how to not destroy yourself sitting at a table and drawing for 12 hours a day. Like, that would have been super useful. I second I'm, that. 
Yeah, I'm with you there. It's so interesting to me that I've talked to um, maybe four or five different majors now, and it was the animation people who were the first to talk about, like, mental and physical health and how important it is to take care of yourself. And I'm like, that is so telling. <laughs> yeah. Hold on. I'm going to... I've got to plug my phone in. Oh, I forgot you're on your phone. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's so weird. Taylor, did you have anything to add? Um, saving the best for worst, or the, the worst for last, I see. All um, of it. Yep. Yeah, like, I mean, I, there's only so much I can really add. Like, I like what everyone else has touched upon. Like, I liked Candy's point about how it, there's this great, like, kind of family atmosphere to it, because sequential art is this weird major in terms of size in that it kind of rides the border between super big major and small major. Like, it's, it's not as big as video game and animation, but it's not as small as, you know, fabrics and, like, uh, fibers and stuff. Um, so it's in this great in-between where, you know, it's like Cheers. You go where everyone knows your name, kind of. <laughs> and um, th there's the workhorse thing. Like, I will say, and this isn't me bragging because I have a point to this, but it's like I got a 4.0 GPA through my major, and that's not me saying, like, oh, man, I'm so fucking great. You know, it's, it's <laughs> it is, going, like I cared enough because of the classes that I wanted to do good because I was having fun and enjoying myself and I felt that they were worthwhile because, you know, you learn to take a lot of pride in your work and to go back to my point with environments, props, and structures where I had that C grade on that one project, it was like, because, you know, you, you, you put pride in your work, you put yourself out there, and you know you can do better when people critique it and stuff, and you want to improve. So it instills in you this natural need to do better and improve, and that comes with being a sequential artist, because you need that. You need to always be improving and wanting to do better and wanting to do more. Um, as far as negatives, yeah, it's, it's, again, the thing we touched upon about, you know, not having the the real world class and the the um, adult the community should be called adulthood um, uh, should not be just a, a, a elective. It should be like it should be they should what they should, they should do is they should like pepper it throughout all the classes. Like it should be an intro. It should be in Viz one, Viz two, and senior. Um, if they can't find room to make just a flat out course for it. Um, um, what else? I might just, you know, this is more of a nitpick, I guess, than anything, but just the way that some stuff is organized, like, I think sometimes Editor's Day can be chaotic, you know? Like, again, you know, they're, they're, they don't, it feels like they, they don't get the, the, necessarily the editors to meet the demand, you know, of all the people, because it's a big deal, like, they hype it up, and it's like, everyone wants to do it, and you're going to have people from all four levels, you know, from freshman to senior wanting to do it, and, you know, because you're going to have people, it's like Christina said, like, do it when you can, like, you know, try to do it as much as you can. So I feel like maybe there, there might be a better way they can organize it just to make it more effective, efficient, and, you know, get more people, get more editors if possible, um, maybe make it, maybe have a couple throughout the year, maybe have one in fall, or one in winter, and then one in spring, because they do have the comic arts form, right? Do they yeah. still do that? Yeah. I think. Which is kind of, it's not quite an editor's day, because it's not necessarily editors, um, it's all artists or writers. Like, there was one time I knew that they were trying to get Mark Wade, which I thought was insane. Um, they didn't end up getting him just because he was so busy, but that's where I met, like, Riley Brown, um, and people like that, and I think maybe if they just had one per quarter, that'd be good. Like, if you had a fall one, Comic Arts Forum is in winter, Editor's Day is in spring. So, you know, maybe if they can just find a third one that can kind of balance it out, and then you can get more more for your time and more bang for your buck, if you will. Something like that. Like, anything that gets professionals in with sequential art majors. You know, just anything to promote more networking. As vague as that is. No, I think you had some good solutions to the problem by, like, um, trying to do some stuff scattered throughout the year instead of saving everything to spring when you're already in panic mode anyway. <laughs> you're already, like, sleep-deprived and, like, you know, you're half-dead. 
and you're just like, I want to go home and sleep for, you know, the five minutes that I'll have in the next 24 hours of sleep, you know, so. I yeah. will, I will about. say, uh, one slightly off topic note about how everyone's been saying sequentials an entire family. I had one moment, I think it was during my sophomore year, and I think it was in uh, maybe a Larison class. I can't remember, but um, we were talking about the sequential department and how it like contrasts with the other departments. And some, I think it was either Larison or Dove, said, yeah, sequential is the only building, Norris is the only building that you can walk down the halls and hear laughter in classrooms. And everyone was like, oh my god. And we all went silent and then suddenly heard like a burst of laughter from down the hall. <laughs> and it is but, very uh... true. Everyone in the sequential department, past and present, is used to being like that weird kid in school who was really into comics and then they got to school and suddenly everyone was that weird kid. Oh, and it's like very relieving. <laughs> That's such a nice, like, oh, they gave me the fuzzies. Ew. <laughs> But really, like, it's also the only building that you'll hear a whip being cracked and, like, people being chased down the hall, and you'll hear animal noises and just everything. It's weird. Animal noises are probably low, just to, you know, to clarify. Yeah, anybody shouting is John Lowe, so... Yeah. <laughs> and you can, and like what's what's cool too with the professors is that you can always just like hang out with them. Like I remember there was times where I just would go like after like senior or viz two, I would just like go hang out with Larison and talk to him about the class and yep. where I'm at. Like they always promote that. And I remember like the last day of class before graduation, I had my final class. It was like five o'clock or whatever that we got out, and I just went up to Norris. Just to kind of say goodbye to everybody. Yeah, same. Yeah, and I was like, and like Larison, I think he was doing his maquette class, and he was like taking him apart and putting him away, and I was just like hanging out with him and talking to him, and I, you know, wanted to go talk to Dove, talk to Goto. Um, I saw Gildersleeve because, and it was really great. It was like serendipity in a way, um, where because because Gildersleeve doesn't isn't with the school anymore, and oh. it was his last day. I think I don't think he he's with them anymore. No. But he was like getting, he was like getting ready to leave, and Gildersleeve was kind of always my favorite, just because you know he was so like outspoken and goofy and. I think we had his class together actually, the materials and technique. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, and um, like I just like I was walking, I was leaving, and he was leaving at the same time, so I got to chat with him for a couple minutes. So, you know, and I don't know if you do that in every major, but you certainly do it in sequential. You know, like I like I felt the need at, before I left to say goodbye to everybody as as much as I could. So. End scene. Yeah, oh. definitely. They're like such good people, and it's kind of cool to see um, like a balance between like um, well, it's probably the same with any professors. Some of them are like you know really family types, and then others are more of like you know the solo route in life. And I got like a lot of um, like balancing family and marriage advice from some of my professors, which was totally unexpected, but was really great, you know, because I was gonna get married like right after I graduated. And yeah, it's really, I think they always made me feel like um, you could always talk to them, like they're not necessarily a, a peer, like you're on the same level because they are an authority, but um, you never feel like you can't talk to them. They're very welcoming, and I always appreciated that. Yeah, because so, it's like yeah. I said, like once you graduate, you're their peer, essentially. You know, like I remember, and we should probably plug this because I know, Kennedy, you're going to Heroes Con, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so me and Kennedy, I know for, sure, for a fact, are going to be at Heroes Con in, at the end of June, and okay. Gad has a table there. And it was great last year because, you know, that was like the one-year anniversary of graduating. And I hadn't seen everyone in a year, and it was just, you know, going over to the booth and saying hi to everybody. I love HeroesCon for that reason. It's kind of like a big SCAD sequential, like, reunion because it's so close to the school. That's still, to this day, one of my favorite cons I've been doing for the other years or so. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's great because, you know, because um, Brittany Peer, who I'm working on the uh, Kickstarter with, She's gonna be there. We're gonna be sharing a table. So yeah, it's like this big, it's like this big reunion thing. That's always fun. So yeah, it's a pretty <laughs> close community. We stick together. I think there's something about like we were all that kid that got beat up 
you know? <laughs> right? And now I made a point of the of our Naruto manga. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're all that kid running to, like Naruto down the hall and being like, you don't understand me, Mom. Like, the one yeah. kid in gym. Yeah. And then suddenly everyone understands you, and they're like, yeah, I've got my headband in my backpack, too, and you fucking high five about I'm gonna be Hokage, too, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hokage together. It's awesome. Yeah, it's good stuff. You're the Naruto to my Sasuke. Ew, okay, we're done. <laughs> this is shut down now. Thanks a lot, Taylor. <laughs> I've got, like, a list of Naruto. Okay, so now that we're out of my good old questions, I think we'll start going through some of the ones from the... This, uh, the chat over here I've got a couple, so feel free to chime in with whatever one you want to answer. Um, someone asked that, oh, this is a good one. So if somebody wants to do storyboarding, do they do sequential art, or do they do animation as a major? I think there's a storyboarding minor. Um, yeah. I guess that's a really good question. Do you, don't you, like, I thought you had to do storyboarding if you were in animation. Like you had to take this, the elective classes. I could be wrong. I, so, I know they're not required for sequel. What what's always? Oh no no no! I'm sorry. I think I talked over you. I said what's always most telling to me when I'm looking at a minor. So sequent or sorry, sequential is a major. Um, storyboarding is currently a minor. Um, and concept is currently a minor, and there's a bunch of other minors, but look at where the classes overlap, because there's some classes that are required for the minor, and if the majority of the required classes are animation, you should pro probably, probably just take animation. Yeah, but if the majority of required classes are sequential, you should take sequential, because it ties into those concepts more tightly. Um, and I believe that both with concept and storyboarding, the majority of required prereqs or, you know, non-special minor classes are sequential. So you might as well just go full sequential. Yeah. Well, because yeah, yeah, yeah. the workload's completely different, isn't yeah. it? Like, you're going to have to do a lot of, you know, if you're not in, you know, in the bag for drawing the same thing repeatedly, you know, and all the work <laughs> that goes into animation, you probably should just stick to sequel and just... Because, I, I mean, I know a ton of sequential majors that minored in storyboarding, so... I still do regret that I didn't take at least a few animation classes, because I feel like they really nailed, like, um... A, well, I mean, drawing the same thing over and over again, but I mean, like, uh, pumping out, like, a whole lot of drawing, like, loose sketching within, like, a certain amount of time. Like, I feel like I wish I had taken that um, 2D animation class or, like, whatever their intro... Yeah, action analysis with Troy, I was going to say. Yeah, yeah. Draw super fast forever. Yeah. <laughs> drawing, it's just ass of drawing. Are we supposed to, are we allowed to, yeah, whatever. <laughs> we'll, uh, it's alright. <laughs> I've sworn it's the like truth. three times, so. I didn't know. It's the truth, though. There's no sugar coating it. Action analysis sounded like a hardcore class, and I wish I could have taken it. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I, I lived with several animation majors who were like taking action analysis at the same time, and at meals they would just all be hunched over their sketchbooks, drawing everyone in the cafeteria between bites of food, like to try and fill the required number of sketchbooks. Heads down, no talking. They're all just like. <laughs> Side note, that was something I had to get used to after leaving Savannah because it's like such a little haven like that totally caters to artsy types and the students at the school. So you can go into any Starbucks and draw people and nobody's weirded out by it. But then, you know, go home to Illinois and just like, oh, I'm going to be out here doodling people and they're like, what are you doing? Or that, that dreaded moment when they make eye contact with you and they're like, is that me? Do I look like that? And you're like... <laughs> and they like flash their pistol because it's like, you know, you're in some like weird like open carry state. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> the heartland, man. Don't are take you drawing my face? What are you doing there? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're in, you're in the Midwest. It's all the I'm same. I'm standing thing. my ground right now. <laughs> Oh, that mostly covers that one. We have another question about somebody who is really interested in the writing side of visual storytelling, and they want to know, would it be better to major in screenwriting then, or 
then I guess they're not going to get any of the drawings, so should they do sequential art and just take the advanced uh, scripting class? Um, I don't actually know a lot about the screenwriting oh side God. of school. Um, I, if I had to, like, guess, I mean, I would say maybe if you for sure want to do scripting, like, for comics, like, comics is what you want to do, um, then I would say major in sequential, maybe minor in script writing, or at least take a lot of the elective classes in that major. And definitely, definitely take the advanced script writing course with me. Yeah. yeah, I would. It would, it would, oh, it would be more like what what comics are supposed to look like and how they're supposed to flow. Which, if you want yeah. to script for comics, specifically as opposed to like other sorts of things like plays or movies, then you would. Want yeah, because because it isn't just yeah because it isn't just like straight script writing. Like it's not quite the same thing as as script writing for movies. Like you still kind of need to know like how comics work. And, like, yeah. Of that writing style is, I guess. Yeah, because I, I know at least one writing major, or they were a film major majoring in focusing on script writing, and they took pieces class. And so I guess that would be an option. Um, maybe not necessarily if you were focusing solely on comic scripting. Like if you wanted to kind of do a general screenwriting thing, or general creative writing. Yeah. Um, I'd also, I would say, you would, I would suggest at least taking one sequel class where you have to draw, like maybe intro, where even like, and obviously it's, it would, it's probably gonna be pretty tough if you're someone who doesn't draw very much, but it, I would say it's invaluable in, like you know, others have said, and you, you understand more because you, you, you can kind of empathize with what the artist will have to do with your writing. So yeah. you get, it'll teach you what to better do in your scripts to make it easier and make a better product. So, Like thinking about how many panels go on the page, which mm -hmm. was like a big pitfall with a lot of folks in like the script writing class where we're all like trying to shoehorn as many panels onto a page as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a good background to get. Well, I'll play devil's advocate and say if you are not interested in comic scripting, if you're interested in film and television writing, you probably shouldn't come to SCAD. SCAD is an artistic school. Uh, and take this with a grain of salt, but if you're just into creative writing, if you're just into scripting and narrative only, and not interested in maybe also learning to produce or direct or, there's probably you less know, be a cinematographer or <laughs> DP or something, right. SCAD is not the place for you if you are not at least interested in exploring the visual side also if you just want to write I think we have a writing major I think I met one and a half of them well the thing well the thing about I have a friend who's a creative writing major I had some I had a friend who was a creative writing major and he ended up having to do I think we have I do think we have some kind of creative writing major but I can't speak to it, and you would be going to a visual arts school to do writing. So yeah. I, I don't know what the professors are like or anything. Yeah, that's. I would not uh, suggest it personally. Yeah. Devil's advocate. Yeah. I was saying, um, I have a friend who's a creative writing major, but he took a ton of film classes. Like I don't know if it was his minor or something like that, but they're uh, intertwined a lot. And I have another friend, yeah. like the friend I mentioned before, who's a film major. And but he was focusing on script writing. I mean, you have to take a uh, cinematography class. You have to do some kind of final yep. project, whether it's like, you know, a big screenplay. Um, so make sure film is something you're really into. Like I would, I, I would suggest going into film and television over creative writing if you want to write, um, because yeah. But you have to be, you have to be into the film side you have too. To be into the mm -hmm. film side, you know. Otherwise. Yeah, I don't know, because even if you're going into creative writing, I think you have to do film stuff, and you have yeah, to write. And you have to do like, yeah. There's always a mix of like a cocktail of electives that you can combine in the areas where you would like just a little bit more of something, because uh, electives aren't only for like uh, just random exploration of trying to figure out what you want to do in general, but it's also once you figure out something, it's like, oh, well, I am sequential, but I hope I can squeeze out every last writing class that I can get. You know, that way you can use your electives to do all that stuff, too, and just, like, enhance 
that portion of your major, if that makes sense. Everything's pretty flexible, so you should be able to do something yeah. like that. And, I mean, people graduate every year not actually working in their major. So, you know, it's what you take away from the school. Definitely. Someone wants to know um, what exactly a pitch is, because this term is thrown around a lot, and I guess they want to know more of, like, what actually consists of a pitch. A pitch consists of. <laughs> Ness, did you take the pitch? I did take the pitch. I love the pitch. So this is, this is like, your <laughs> realm. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think pitch? some of you guys maybe have more hands-on practice pitching, um, but in the pitch class, uh, the goal was pitching to um, Phil Craven, who is the lead story artist on Dreamwork, at DreamWorks on Kung Fu Panda and other animated films. And we basically had to create something to pitch to him. I pitched a game to him. Other people pitched an animation pitch to him. Some people pitched a sequential thing. It's very flexible. You just got to work with Goto, talk to professors. Um, you basically, a pitch is a quick explanation of a, like, a kind of media uh, that you would like to get funded or produced or picked up by an exec, a uh, director, uh, you know, a pl everything, publisher, you know, an everything editor. Everything from a game uh, to a movie to a TV show to a comic book. Yeah, everything, everything gets pitched. to be pitched. Yeah, and it's basically just a summary very quick, uh, what it's about, beginning, middle, end, you must know the ending, you must must tell whoever you're pitching it to the ending, uh, they're not a reader, they need to know what they're investing in, that's my biggest part of pitches, tell them how it ends, uh, explanation of characters, plot, what's it going to be, where it takes place, try, you know, hopefully it's interesting and you get picked up, but I think other people have more experience actually pitching, which is... Um, I mean, the good thing about SCAD is, like, uh, you actually do get a little bit, even if you don't take the, the elective, the pitch, you do get a little bit of experience in the scripting class, um, because part of the final project for Nice's class is you have to actually, so you have to pitch a comic to a publisher, like, it's a requirement for the class, like, you literally have to go with them and take it down to the post office, like, you can't get out of it even if you don't want to pitch to the publisher, um, which... I, think, uh, I don't think you have to send it anymore, necessarily. Oh, we, oh. we didn't send it in my class. Yeah, when I took it... it we had to suffer our embarrassment of sending our unfinished pitches to the publishers, even though we knew we weren't ready to get picked up yet. Good practice. It's good, good practice. practice. Practice, or as Nice would say, you know, customize, or um, make, familiarizing you with the stench of failure or something like that. <laughs> He's so good. He's so good at telling it like it is. He's the happiest person. <laughs> it's true, though. Um, it was a good exercise, and when I've done pitches after that, um, I've always gone back through the material from that class and thought, okay, what does this contain? And most of the times, um, if somebody's taking open, if there's an open call for submissions, they'll tell you exactly what to put in this thing, you know, whether they want character designs and an overview of the story, uh, a production timeline. Sometimes they want to know like how long something's going to take, so a lot of times they have um, suggestions on what to do. But, yeah. And it's slightly different, you know, depending on what it is you're actually pitching, like if it's for animation, or if it's for a comic, or if it's for a game, it's, you know, whoever you're pitching to is probably going to like say what they want to see from you. I'm back. All right, yay. <laughs> Sorry about your that. Phone. I don't know what happened. <laughs> I'm impressed it, it that your like phone's able to hang in there. <laughs> <laughs> About to move on to the next question. Um, what do you guys do during your summers um, when you're away from SCAD? Did you guys take any uh, summer classes, or did you need that time to recover? <laughs> uh, recovery. Um, say this one, definitely. I had to take, um, because of uh, a family event thing, I had to uh, leave for, and basically leave an unfinished quarter, so I had to make up two qu two classes over the summer, but that was just a necessity and not so much like, I want to do this. Um, so I ended up taking two online classes, which, you know, might be an avenue that incoming students might want to at least look into. 
Um, cause, is it possible to take four classes a quarter? Is that a thing? Yes. I, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Something, but, like, I think it's possible. Yeah. I think yeah, you I, have to have this, like, tearful sit-down with your academic instructor, and they tell you, don't do it, please don't do it, and you say, but I gotta, and they're like, okay. <laughs> I've got I have a do. friend who took four classes a quarter for, like, a couple years straight, mm-hmm. but she's crazy. <laughs> That's very difficult to do, by the way, for those of y'all. Very those. difficult. Uh, I'll say over my summers, I spent most of them... <laughs> Gave myself some recovery time, some sleep time, and then I actually wrote a lot, especially after Nisa's scripting class. I wrote a lot and, like, the little sketches, nothing serious. I didn't give myself any major projects until I really graduated, but I would basically do a lot of idea generation over winter break and summer break because they're the same length. SCAD has a weird schedule. You should look it up if you're thinking mm-hmm. about going to SCAD. But... I would basically create this backlog of like characters and ideas so that when I got into classes like Nisa's scripting or materials or techniques or whatever where you need to basically come up with a story in several days to do a project or you know just generate something about a narrative and you're like sitting in front of your computer drawing a blank I had something to pull on so that's what I use my breaks for. I agree with that 100%. Idea. It's so hard to just pull something from nothing when somebody snaps their fingers and demands <laughs> it. So when you're relaxing over the summer and you get all those ideas, write them down because you'll want something to pull from later. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say basically what all I did was just draw, you know. I just, because you never want to <laughs> yeah. get rusty. Um, and you should just make that a habit anyway, is just to keep drawing every day if you can. Obviously some stuff gets in the way, but if you can, try to draw at least even little stuff every day, just so you're always kind of thinking you're in the mindset of creating and being on the top of your game, and you're never rusty. So that, that that's what I did basically. So yeah, I did something a little different um, every summer. I think I um, at least worked most of one summer. Um, probably took classes at least one, and then um, my sophomore summer, well, sophomore going into junior year, I actually studied abroad in Hong Kong. Uh, so SCAD has a couple of um, sister campuses. One is in Lacoste, France, and one is in Hong Kong. And um, they're like full. Well, I mean, the one in Hong Kong is like a full campus that's over there. So that's that was awesome. Definitely take advantage of that if you get the if you get the chance. And yeah. Yeah. yeah I second guess study. Now that, yeah. Now that you mentioned Lacoste. In 2011, I got to go on the final sequential Japan trip. I know. Uh, right. But yeah, so I, I, yeah, it was it was over winter break. It was like two and a half, two weeks out of the winter break, and you go to Japan with Goto and just run around, and then your h- homework basically, like the entire class work, was uh, between coming home and the winter break you got over Christmas and then going back to school, you were supposed to create, like, a 10-page comic based on whatever the heck you experienced in Japan and whatever you wanted to write. So, Japan trip. Yeah. It's gone now. I told myself that year, I was like, oh, you know what? I'm only a a mistake ever. Well, that's why just just go for everything. Just go to the... I don't care if you're a freshman, go to Editor's Day. I don't care if, you know, if you want to go to Japan, apply to... Whatever new trip they have, like yeah, this is like this what, is what you're paying for, you know, when you're going to a school like this. It's like it's not just you know learning how to draw and learning like the art fundamentals. It's, that's the reason why it's so expensive is because you have all these different opportunities. So definitely take advantage of all of them if you can. Yeah. Mhm. Our next question um, is about how do you get freelance jobs while you're in school, I guess. How do you balance it? And then also, how does that work? Like, how do you do freelance? What websites do you browse and all that? Uh, I did freelancing in school, and I still don't think I know how to fully answer that question. <laughs> It's been a different uh, thing every time. Like, I mean, it's some times it's just somebody that you know, like a friend of a friend needs, you know, this thing designed or whatever. Um, I tried to uh, learn to stay away from some of those freelancing sites like Odesk and like Upwork and Fiverr and things like that, simply because 
and the quality of them is usually not very good, but um, I guess if you're just starting out, things like that are, are like a lead. Um, what else? That's like yeah. some form, some form of it's basically just social media, like some form of social media just to advertise yourself. That yeah yeah, social media is definitely a lot of it actually. Even if it's just commissions, you know, like oh man, I need some extra cash. I'm gonna do busts, so you know, twenty bucks or something, you know, or more. Probably should be more. Yeah, I never did those kinds of like that's. Yeah, you know. pay yourself a fair wage. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I can only, this may only apply to games, but uh, go out to the conventions, PAX, oh, yeah, Prime, yeah. East, South, you know, all the PAXs are amazing because there's only PAX games on there. the moon! There's, yeah! <laughs> there's, there's developers on the floor, and you can talk to developers directly. Um, E3 is awesome, GDC, you should be going if you want to be in games. Uh, you get can get your portfolio reviewed, you can like I said, meet developers, meet recruiters. They're all right there. Um, I think I had another point, but I can't remember. Oh, freelancing. Yeah, so I got I got my first freelance like thing. Well, not my first, but my first major freelancing thing because I went to PAX East and met a bunch of Riot Games people and started working for them. My winter quarter of my senior year, which is right when I was getting into like senior project and Viz2, and that's what I was saying. I had to like multiply and double things. But I mean, this whole talk we've been saying the professors are awesome. Make friends with the professors. Talk to the professors. I was in an advanced concept art class where I went to Melissa Curtin, the professor at the time, was like, "Hey, I got some amazing like freelance work with a game studio. You're teaching the games concept art class. You know, can we work something out here?" So she let me actually as part of my class project, I was just doing freelance concept art work for the concept art class. Yeah, and was like, yeah, as a part of your... Yeah, it was part like, of the grade, because I just didn't have time to, like, juggle everything. And she worked with me, because yeah. she was like, well, you've got the goal of the class, so let's figure yeah, out yeah, how, yeah, you know... You're basically doing the class if you're getting paid to do freelance. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, again, just, like... You can balance it. You don't have to shoulder everything. Like, talk to your professors. Yeah. I think my best piece of advice as far as getting them is just being visible, like having your stuff out. Uh, for a lot of those stuff was that I did, um, you know, this webcomic while I was in school. That, that went for a lot. I mean, it, I didn't really think much of it, you know, while I was doing it. But, I mean, uh, just getting that out there, putting that in front of people that I feel like the webcomic by itself was the biggest advertisement for like my portfolio than you know anything as far as like the uh, the school like uh, job services and things like that. Like I feel like um, having mm. the social media up to date and functioning and active is is probably one of the biggest things that'll get you freelance. Yeah, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, you just have to be out there. I can't tell you how many jobs um, that I've got have not been because I sent a resume and I wrote a cover letter and then I met them in person and shook their hand. It's like being on Twitter at the right time and somebody's like, hey, this this needs to get finished. I need somebody to do color flats for this like right now. And I'm like, okay, PayPal me the money, send it to Dropbox, and then we're done. And I can't, and I can't emphasize enough how awesome Twitter is for comic artists and sequential artists. Because yes. you can directly interact with, like, your heroes. <laughs> like, you know, you have Chris Samney, who's, like, my favorite comic artist. And I'll just, like, hey, here's a, here's a Black Widow drawing I did. And I, like, tagged him in it. And he was like, oh, this is awesome. So you have increased visibility because you can tag people and stuff. And, you know, I've that's how, like, I mean, you guys, some of you guys might know, like, Ian McGinty. You know, mm -hmm. I've never met Ian McGinty. But we're, like, kind of now friends through Twitter. Where we'll just like send pictures of Bobby Hill back and forth <laughs> and talk about welcome to the show side. <laughs> I'm so glad. No, it's true. Um, it, Twitter makes it so much easier to reach out to other people, and then there's that satisfaction of like you might be posting something about um, I don't know a movie you saw or a comic that somebody worked on, and then they they like it press that little heart button, and you're like, oh, you acknowledge me. You know I exist for a brief moment. Except I noticed. And I exactly. Like, you know, again, your professors are a great networking tool because 
I did um, the Art for Hope Nepal thing with Viz Media, which is this charity art book that you can get through Comixology. It's like five bucks. It's totally worth getting. Um, and I got it through... I went to Larison. I'm like, hey, are there any editors that you have that I can just shoot an email to? And I did uh, Joel Enos with Viz. And, like, I mean, Viz doesn't really hire people, but it's great. It's a great person to, to have just to talk and bounce ideas and pitches off of. And he came to me, and he was like, hey, uh, we need people for this, you know, art book thing. And because it's for charity, we can only really pay him maybe, like, 100 bucks, but, you know. And so I did a thing for it, and, you know, it's a fully published thing. I mean, it's 100 bucks is, is on the low end for a normal situation. But, yeah, it's for charity, and I still got paid for it. And, you know, it's still an official published thing. So, yeah, it's, a lot of it, it, it's not so much, like, there's not really a huge interview process necessarily, you know, even though we, we kind of go through that training and with Editor's Day, but that's just one of dozens of different scenarios you can do to get work. You know, they, they always say, like, no one gets into the comics industry the same way. Sometimes it's just no one a dude, or sometimes it's, you know, actually is sending out stuff. Sometimes it's a portfolio review at a, at a con. Sometimes it's having a table at a con and a publisher, an editor walks by and picks up your mini comic or a print or something. So it, it's really just, Lava. you know, just throw stuff and see what sticks kind of. So that's what I would suggest. Mm-hmm. You never know who you're going to meet, so be cool. <laughs> yeah, what's, um, what's, this, what's this, the, the thing where it's like you can be fast, be good, or be easy to work with. You can pick, you can pick two. Yep. Yes, so. I have found that to be so true. Make sure one of them is be easy to work with because you don't want to be known as the dick in, in the community. Fair enough. In the industry. That's what I would suggest anyway. You know. Mm-hmm. Like maybe it's like you like super good to transcend being you know a huge butthole you know like Rob Liefeld but you know who somehow gets <laughs> you know he's like he's like none of those things so maybe it's not that true but you know whatever. <laughs> he's Sometimes an aberration. It's an who yeah. even knows? Or you can be you can be two of those things, or you can know people. Or you can know people. <laughs> or that. <laughs> it's true. Um, let's see, do a couple more questions and we'll probably wrap it up. Um, oh, uh, they're asking about a program called Out to Launch, but I think maybe that's what uh, Summer Swarm has been renamed to, because I don't think I ever heard anything called oh. Out to Launch, but, or do you know what I'm or, talking or is, about? Is it part of the orientation process for freshmen that they've renamed? Maybe. I don't know, it sounds like a dating or, astronauts. I don't know. <laughs> uh, sorry. I don't Personally. know anything. Okay, I will say, I don't know I don't know anything about out to launch, but I do know ton of shit, ton of stuff about the CLC program, the Co- Collaborative Learning Center. Uh, highly recommend. Look up the Collaborative Learning Center if you're going to SCAD and do it. It's, it's great. Use your electives <laughs> wisely. Mm-hmm. Just make, make you add, just do it. <laughs> yeah, just do it. I feel like I might want to I'm back, one. I made it. <laughs> hey. <laughs> oh, I feel like I'm I might want to do a died. segment sometime about um, internships, and I kind of want to um, bug you about what you guys did with Microsoft, so we'll talk about yeah, that sometime. Yeah, I should oh, you're like, like Liz in on that? Year with Microsoft. Yeah, I think oh, that'd be really good. NDA still has, the non-disclosure still has, like, Another three years, but uh, I can talk about this CLC and Redmond and all that good stuff. All oh, right. Yeah, like okay. dozens of years in the future, we'll be like old and we can find yeah, right. we talk about it. <laughs> well, honestly, I'll have no portfolio stuff because it will be like it's, I think it was like a five or six year NDA. Yeah, so all the like until, yeah until it comes out. Yeah, exactly. Until it comes out. The the dozens of like art I have, it's like oh, this is old. <laughs> That was so frustrating with freelancing, though, right off the bat leaving school, because it was like the first two things I did were books, so they're going to take the better part of a year to put together, and so anytime somebody's just like, hey, you graduated, do you have a job, what are you doing? I'm like, yeah, I'm working, and they're like, tell us about it, and you're like, I can't, though, So like, probably for another couple you. months. 
So yeah, and it sounds like you're lying. You're like, oh, I'm working on a book, but um, so if you, to show. Top secret. if you you go to my website, I have a tab at the top that says locked work. And mm. when I was applying to jobs and had stuff. I couldn't necessarily show, I would create a unique password for an employer and send it to them with my cover letter saying, if you would like to see some of my previous client work that is not in my portfolio, the password is blank. I have okay. seen this oh. done multiple times. I've seen it on uh, other artists like who is I don't even know. Like yeah, professionals so do it all the time. You can also just create a PDF and send it to the employer or potential employer and be like, hey, just don't let this leave your desk like your computer station, but here's some stuff. It happens a yeah. lot, and you have to be very careful. Yeah, so this is kind of like a tangent, but like uh, since we're already talking about it, I feel like if you are doing NDA work, uh, it's really important to also carve out time for you to do personal work on your own so that you keep your portfolio current and so you Excuse me. And so you keep your like social media stuff and everything active. Um, so like for example, what I've been doing uh, lately is this thing on Facebook called the Daily Spit Paint, and it's basically just like a 30-minute speed paint thing. So like even something as simple as that, like that you do every day, because that keeps your, you know, it keeps you current. It, you do like lose a lot of time when you're working on long-term projects that you can't actually show to anybody until the thing comes out. So keep those skills sharp. That's a good point, because it's bad to have a dead zone of stuff that you're just like, well, you can't show anything that you're working on, so you are just quiet on social media for a while, and that's like such a time when you could be connecting with more people for what is going to follow up after this job. So, yeah. Join the Daily Drawing Challenge group. We've got like 4,000 people. We could use more. <laughs> good stuff. Okay, I think we'll wrap it up with one last question, which I think we'll all agree on anyway. Um, this person wants to know um, if it's worth investing in a tablet, like um, a Wacom, a Wacom tablet. And I think we all say yes. yes. <laughs> I think you have, I have to. Uh, I've I've been working with uh, tablet PCs for like since like the middle of high school, where it's like it's got a screen that you can draw on kind of like a Cintiq but it's a laptop and those tend to be a pretty big upfront expense but they're so good to work on they're just like I'm kind of spoiled I can't actually work on anything else now which is a downside yeah um, I would say as someone who like 75 percent of my work is traditional you know I pencil I ink traditionally um, but the other 25 percent is digital coloring which I don't consider myself a colorist but I'll color my stuff when I need to, and and even then, it's like super great investment. You can get some that are pretty cheap, like between fifty and a hundred dollars. Some of the smaller ones. I I just Amazon searched the Wacom Bamboo Splash Pen Tablet, which is the cheapest one they have. It's like a hundred bucks with four dollars shipping. If that doesn't sound cheap, you compare that to a three thousand dollars Cintiq, yeah. and a yeah. tablet is a very nice investment. Plus, I mean, if you go to SCAD, you're going to have access to Cintiqs and stuff too. That's true. So, yeah. Here's the it's thing like kind of that I like everything. Yeah. Here's something that I ended up um, finding myself in a little bit of trouble. So I had a bamboo, and the pen broke was not repairable, so it was like, I'm going to have to get a new tablet anyway. And we have the digital coloring class where one of the supplies is you're required to get a Cintiq pen for the Cintiq monitors. We typically, I think, got uh, Montgomery's leftovers, right? We get all the stuff the animation students don't need yeah, anymore because they have the most current stuff downs. and we do not. So we're stuck with a bunch of Cintiq 3s, and they're not going to update to the Cintiq 4 until the semester after I take this class. <laughs> so at that point, I decided to just buy my own tablet entirely and haul my laptop to class. So don't depend on SCAD to maybe have the most update, up-to-date equipment for the sequential department. I feel like we get forgotten a little bit. Or maybe that's never happened to anybody else and it was just like the perfect storm, but really I was just like, I'm not gonna buy a Cintiq 3 pen 
that I can't use next semester, so maybe I'll just buy the whole tablet anyway. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't think you can rent pens at the uh, sequential building. I think the only place you can do that is the animation building. Do the you guys cage. know? You gotta go to the key. I think that's yeah. correct. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think some great. people did that for the digital coloring class when I was in it. They like went all the way to Monty to rent the pens. <laughs> I thought you weren't allowed to take those pens out of the outside of Monty. I could be mistaken, but uh, I could have gotten them mixed up. Point being, uh, buy a tablet. Yeah, they're not that expensive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you guys know any other um, cheaper, I guess, alternatives to just getting a Wacom tablet? Um, other than the ones that have been mentioned so far? I mean, used on Amazon, 60 bucks for a Wacom tablet. My first Wacom tablet is an old Graphire 4 that cost a couple hundred, and it's still, like, running. It's it's a freaking plastic piece. <laughs> but, but you're really not going to find a, a quality, like, non-crazy buggy drawing tablet for less than 60 bucks. Agreed. So and if, if that's surprised. something you really want. Yeah. But it's such a worthy investment because you're going to be using it for years. Well, yeah, yeah. plus, mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, you do have access to, like, really nice Cintiqs and computers and stuff at the SCAD facilities, but if it's a weekend and the, all the Cintiqs are filled up and you're like, oh, my God, I need to do digital work on my homework, it's just so, so nice to have a backup or be able to just gather up your stuff. Like, if you can't work in your room, if you live with a roommate and there's something going on and you just need to move to work at the student center which is beautiful and awesome and I, I love that place um, and you just want to spread out and bring your you know laptop and Cintiq or, or tablet and work like mm -hmm. it, it's very versatile and you can even bring it to the buildings like it was awesome. Mm -hmm. Good advice because yeah sometimes uh, there's limited space in the animation building especially because there are people who that's their major, and we are <laughs> the vultures. Yeah, and if the there's, if there's like, if, right, like if, if there's only a few computers who have a certain software loaded, but you have it at your on your computer at home, you've got the student version, and like all the, you know, the limited number are taken at a computer lab, and just gotta do what you gotta do. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's all the time that we have for tonight, but um, thank you guys so much for um, joining me tonight and answering the questions. You guys are super awesome, and I'm so glad to have, like, a mini... I'm so glad that we can have a mini sequential reunion. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. 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 Your cheer is so enthusiastic, Taylor. I know, right? That's what I'm not for. <laughs> Just have, like, an, a, a soundboard of all of your, like, grunts and groans. We. Like, yeah, we can do it. <laughs> Um, thanks to everybody who tuned in tonight. I hope we answered your questions. Um, this is going to be, like I said, a two to three part series. So I think um, sometime next week is going to be another group of people. And then possibly if there's another group of people, we'll just talk about Editor's Day. So you've got to look forward to. There are a couple other majors I might talk to. I don't know any. Um, I don't know any fashion majors, apparently, that are online, so... You're not good <laughs> anybody can connect some my way, trying to get a hold of some people. And this will be archived, right? It will. It's, so it'll be on YouTube, and so... Throw it at people's future faces, generations. Like, yeah. Yes. This will be what they put in that time capsule for aliens to discover. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's specifically you out. going, yay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Clearly, this, this race was very enthusiastic about their life.